So thank you all again so much for joining us on this hot July day. Um, this is a smaller crowd than it was for our kickoff meeting, which I think is going to be really fantastic. So what I'm hoping to do today is to have a little bit more of a conversation between all of the different organizations, because I know that everyone has been working really hard in the realm of public education and outreach and on the subject of stopping archeological vandalism specifically. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a quick slideshow presentation just to, so we can all get our feet wet a little bit. And um, there will be, like I said, a lot of time for everyone to talk and interact. And this presentation will help structure that conversation. So give me just one moment to pull that up for you. All right, here we go. So thank you again for joining us for our semi-annual UPAN partners meeting. Like I said, we did have a meeting back in January and that was a hugely successful meeting. I was so thrilled to see so many of you guys in person, some of you for the last time in person for a little while. Um, so today we are doing this on Zoom, which has some added uh, you know, drawbacks, but also some benefits. And the big benefit is that we're able to meet people from across the state and it really equalizes that playing field. Where I know last time in January, we had some people in the room and some people not in the room. And there was a little bit of a difference of whose voices got heard. So now everyone will have the same opportunity to contribute. Here's a quick rundown of what we are up to today in this meeting. So very quickly to start off, I'd like to just recap what the Utah Public Archaeology Network is and what is our mission here? What's our, our driving goal? Because I know that all of us here on the phone are either representing ourselves as individuals or we're representing a group and this will help lay the foundation for how that group and how you as, as an individual can articulate with the Utah Public Archaeology Network what being a partner really means. And then we're going to open it up to introductions. We do have about 30 people on the call right now. And I'm uh, going to be honest with you, it can be a little bit tricky to do these introductions, but I think they are really important. Um, so we'll try to go through an alphabetical order and have everyone have an opportunity to give their name and their organization. Um, we'll move on to talking about the campaign to stop archeological vandalism. This was what we did a lot of back in January. And from that um, brainstorming session and those breakout groups, you guys developed a really clear path forward that will absolutely help us achieve our goal of zero new instances of archeological vandalism. We're also going to hear from Friends of Cedar Mesa and Tread Lightly specifically about some of the things they're working it on before opening it up to you guys. And that's where I was talking about, we're actually going to have a larger, broader discussion today. Um, and so we, we'll guide you through that as, um, as that comes up. And specifically, I wanna hear from you guys about what it is you need, how the Utah Public Archeology span Network can help you guys, um, and how all of us in this virtual room can help each other. I think that there's an incredible reservoir of resources and knowledge here. And I think that by putting our heads together, we can really achieve something tremendous. Um, lastly, just to mop up any loose ends, we'll have a roundtable discussion um, of everyone's organizations, projects, and goals, just to make sure that everyone who has an opportunity to speak feels like they, they have taken that opportunity. Um, even if you don't have anything that's necessarily integrating with that campaign and that goal to stop archaeological vandalism, we want to hear from you about what else we're doing. I mean, you know, hopefully our lives aren't completely taken up by trying to stop people from destroying the things we love. Um, so I want to hear from everyone about what else is going on in your world. One moment, please. Sorry. Okay. So starting off with recapping the mission of the Utah Public Archaeology Network. So we're only about a year old now. Um, the Utah Public Archaeology Network really started in the last year. It is a program out of the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, I think many of you probably know that we have a new State Historic Preservation Officer. He's on the call here today, Chris Merritt. He's been really wonderful in supporting and encouraging this. 
here at the state office, we felt like we had a really amazing opportunity to talk to everyone in the state from federal and state agencies that we might partner with on sort of compliance related work to non nonprofit groups to just individual um, humans and, organ and, and organizations who may or may not um, integrate and articulate a lot with archeology, span um, but they still have something to contribute. So we assemble partners and that's all of you guys to work on goals that are of mutual interest to us. And so we are, as a group, defining what that mutual interest is. For this first year, I kind of went ahead and said, you know, stop archeological vandalism, just to kind of wet your whistle and get you excited about what this group can do. Um, and I think that you'll see that today, what we're all accomplishing together, and hopefully we can turn our attention to some other really cool and audacious goals in the future but we are focused on archeological education, outreach and protection of those resources. With a little bit of that background, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen while we do introductions. Um, just to give you a, a quick heads up, um, we're gonna try to go in alphabetical order. So if you are on your, if you're looking at Zoom and you're looking at the participants list, it should default to alphabetical order or I hope it does. And it will default to alphabetical order based on the screen name that you have either you know, defaulted into or written as, as you entered this room, this digital room. So we're gonna try to go in that order. So we're gonna start with Amy and then move on to B, Travis Wright, uh, Chris Merritt, et cetera. And so what I'd like to hear from you guys is your name, the organization you represent and the favorite spot that you've got this summer. And um, I'll promise for myself, to not crowd your favorite spots. And I hope everyone else can make that sort of internal pledge too. But with that, I'm going to quit sharing. Um, I'll kick it off and introduce myself, I guess, and then we'll go to Amy. So I'm Elizabeth Hora. I am public archeologist here at the Utah uh, State Historic Preservation Office. And I'm kind of the person at the hub of the Utah Public Archeology span Network. I hope that you guys all know how to contact me. My contact information will be on the last slide too. And this summer, I got to say my, my favorite spot, my favorite spot pretty much every summer is up in the High Uintas in the Lake District. Particularly, I like East Shingle Lake, but I guess they've, uh, they've graded the road up there now. So it's a little easier for people to get there. So we've got to go find a more remote lake because we saw like six people there last weekend and that's, that's a lot of people. So that's all from me. Um, let's move on. Uh, Amy, are you on? I am on. So. It's nice to meet everybody. I am the new Bureau of Land Management archeologist out of the Moab field office. Um, I just started a couple months ago and I came from the Black Hills in South Dakota, working with the Forest Service previously. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, Got invited to this by Lori, my cohort at the Moab field office. And um, yeah, I just moved into a house, so I haven't really been able to explore very much. So um, any suggestions of where to check out in the Moab area are very welcome. I have next B. Travis Wright. You maybe just go by Travis. So maybe you weren't thinking you would be next, but you're next. And I can unmute you if that helps. Maybe I cannot unmute you. Okay, Travis, we will circle back to you whenever you're ready. Uh, Chris Merritt, can you introduce yourself? I'll do my best. So. Uh, hey, everybody. This is Chris Merritt, the Utah State Historic Preservation Officer. I've uh, been in my position since mid-December as the official ship of Utah. Um, I'm not going to tell you anywhere of my favorite places, but I will give you a small highlight of one benefit from our kickoff meetings. Uh, if you've been on the south shore of the Great Salt Lake, you've probably noticed the Black Rock, which is right off the north end of the Ochre Mountains between I-80 and the Great Salt Lake. Well, that's on state sovereign lands managed by the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. And during this meeting in January, uh, the Wasatch Graffiti Busters attended. 
And I approached them about the really nasty vandalism that that poor natural feature and historical place suffered over especially the last 20 years. And they volunteered their time during the pandemic and they've done a cleanup uh, for a forestry fire and the rock is looking awesome. And so that's just one good example of how just connecting some folks together and, and finding ways to partner is a good outgrowth of having these constant conversations. We're now working with Forestry Fire to actually list the, the Black Rock to the National Register of Historic Places and do some interpretation. Um, maybe I'm even looking at Patrick Morrison, probably apply for an uh, outdoor recreation grant to do for infrastructure out there through nonprofit partners. But Hopefully when you go out and visit, you're doing it. And if you see vandalism or looting behavior, you know, let us with know, let your land managers know and, and we're all in this together. So thanks everybody for spending your afternoon with us today. Great. After Chris, we have two Danielles. Uh, we have Danielle and then Danielle S. So let's start with Danielle with no last name. Hi everyone, this, can you hear me all? Elizabeth, can you hear me? Great. Uh, my name's Danielle Fowles McNiven. I am the Interim Executive Director for Tread Lightly. I've been in this role for the past nine months, but I've been with Tread Lightly for just over six years now. And um, I'm currently in Wyoming, actually at my husband's house. We have, we run two separate places. Um, Tread Lightly is based in Northern Utah, uh, but he lives in Wyoming, so I've been here during this COVID thing. Um, and so because of that, I'd have to say outdoors. Um, gosh, my favorite place, I guess, is just right outside my back door where all of the horses are. But I've been spending a little bit of time in the Shoshone National Forest, which is new to me. And so it's been fun to be able to go visit some new places and see some new, new sites while I've been in Wyoming. That's awesome. Glad you... Um... Glad you're staying safe from COVID out there. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to socially distance when you're in the least populated state in the nation. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and Danielle S. Hi, I'm Danielle Schneider. I'm the UDOT Region 4 archaeologist. Um, my favorite summer spot, I don't know, I've kind of just enjoyed staying in my house. Uh, I've been catching up on a lot of reading. Um, but I guess just some of the walking trails in Cedar City where I live, um, they're just nice to have my dog on and they're not very well used, which is kind of sad, kind of good. So, yeah. Um, Don Montoya. Don, are you able to give yourself a quick introduction? Okay, we will come back to Dawn. Um, Aaron, Aaron Haycock. Oh, she says she's working with a new desktop, so she'll have to do chat rather than her voice and her face. Um, her, just inside her knowledge, her laptop died this morning in another meeting. So she is an intern here at the State Historic preservation office and she's working on some teaching resources for us. Her favorite spot this summer has been a little camping spot by Tony Grove that is a three mile hike north of the lake and the pond up there. So that sounds really nice. Um, next up on the list is Justina. Let's see if I can help unmute you. I gotcha, I got it. Great. I hadn't planned to make a personal appearance, but here I am. Um, uh, I'm Justina with Utah State Parks. I'm uh, one of my roles is as Heritage Resources Coordinator for Utah State Parks. And uh, one of the favorite places I got, because I, I live with my, my 80 year old mother lives with me who has some risk factors. So I have had to be very conservative, <clears throat> but I hadn't been anywhere five miles from my house since March 12th until I started going out to Antelope Island to watch Neowise and did that most of the last two weeks every night. Uh, and it was marvelous. And then one little local discovery was I stumbled onto a little pond that I knew of during my high school years because we used to party there and I didn't know it was there anymore. And it is now filled with like 10,000 um, water lilies, lily pad things that were all, that have been in bloom every time I've been down there. 
it's like stepping into a little magical place. It's amazing. Oh, that sounds so cool. Thank you. Um, Kate and Ella Stratford. Oh, there you go. Hello. Hi, I'm Kate and this is my daughter Ella and we are concerned citizens who um, I used to be an archaeologist and I still work with archaeologists, but uh, uh, our favorite spot is we've been um, going to some various reservoirs and uh, my daughter's got new water boards and, or paddle boards and uh, so we've been checking out the water bodies. That's really awesome. I, I too paddleboard and it's a pro tip. Um, if you're, if you go up to Deer Creek Reservoir, if you live anywhere around there on the north end, the Charleston put in early in the morning, you can go right to the, um, the mouth of where the middle Provo goes into the reservoir and there are beautiful birds, like just incredible. So keep that on the DL if you would. Um, Kevin Thales, he is our director of our of state history. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, I am uh, I'm Kevin Thales. I'm just the acting director. So hopefully, come uh, January, February, the new governor will select a new person. I appreciate uh, you all participating and the great work Elizabeth's doing. Um, I have to say, since I've been teleworking since the earthquake. Um, one of my favorite places is is my bed. I can take naps in the middle of the day if I so feel like it. So <laughs> thanks again. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Chris Grambles. I'm Chris Grambles. I'm the archaeologist at Public Lands Policy Coordinating Office. Um, do the permitting for survey and excavation on state lands, and uh, I guess. My favorite outdoors place right now, and I say this because I keep needing to convince myself that this is my backyard this year because it needs so much work. So there's not another place I'd rather be than out pushing a lawnmower or improving the garden. That's awesome. Even in the, you know, triple digit heat that we're going to get this summer or this weekend, right? Laura Martin, are you still on? Yes, awesome. I am. Hi, I'm Laura Martin. I'm uh, the Cultural Resource Program Manager for the Southeast Utah Group of Parks, National Parks. Um, that's Arches and Canyonlands, Natural Bridges, and Hovaweep uh, National Monument. Uh, I agree with Chris. My favorite place this summer in the summer of COVID has been my yard, my backyard especially. Um, it's also needed much, much attention. <laughs> Uh, but it's been enjoyable, actually, to uh, to sort of just meditate in the backyard. So, thank you. Yeah, that sounds really great. Thank you. Liz Robinson? Hi, I'm Liz Robinson, the Cultural Resources Manager with UDOT. Um, and we've enjoyed the Jordan River Trail, which is pretty close to our house. So a pretty easy John hikes, kids, and um, a nice little opportunity in the middle of the city. Awesome, thank you. Marty Thompson? Okay, we will circle back to you, Marty, in a few minutes. Mike Turlip? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Looks like my video cut out. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, Mike Turlup, BLM archaeologist for the Salt Lake Field Office, and I'd say Knapp's kind of my current favorite place at the time being, being doing a little bit of research down there, so I've been down there quite a bit. And thankfully, a lot of the public hasn't figured out a lot of the backcountry yet, so uh, it's a good place to social distance. Fantastic, thank you. Nicole Lohman? All right, Nicole, we will circle back to you. And I understand that sometimes on these Zoom meetings, technology doesn't do what you think it's going to. Um, Patrick Morrison. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I'm Patrick. I am here with the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation. And not to poach uh, Elizabeth's favorite spot, but the high Uinas Wilderness is pretty tough to beat uh, come mid-late summer. Um, 
locally, I guess a little more locally, uh, like Alta, Albion Basin, um, as high elevated as possible, really, is, is my goal. Okay, and so we've got a couple of people just to circle back. Uh, Dom Montoya, it seems like, does not have audio, so he has introduced himself via chat. He says um, that he is, you know, Dom Montoya, archaeologist in the Moab area. He lives in Castle Valley, and he works for Utah State Parks as a seasonal archaeologist. He also works as the part-time curator at the Anasazi State Park Museum in Boulder, and says that he comes here to get away from the heat. And Nicole also adds that her, Nicole Loman adds that her computer is acting a little bit wonky and that she'll be joining by phone. So Nicole, if you are able to introduce yourself, um, we'll circle back at the end. Um, and if you're not, I think I can maybe introduce you for, I can just introduce you um, to the group. Uh, I'm not sure what your favorite summer spot is, but I'll make something up. Um, so moving down the rest of the list, uh, Paula. Okay, we will circle back to Paula as well. Rebecca, how are you doing? Hi, um, I'm Becca Simon. I am the Assistant State Archaeologist for Colorado. So I'm infiltrating the across the Utah border via Zoom. Um, and uh, I run the program for archaeological application or avocational archaeological certification, um, also known as PAC here in Colorado and um, a lot of the other public outreach and archaeology education that Colorado um, provides, as well as being involved in the various Colorado um, professional organizations and the like. I um, my favorite place in the summer is anywhere that's high with wildflowers and a lake. But I don't have actually seen a ton of those places, but those are the places I always strive to be. Um, and but one that is uh, photographed in my uh, living room is uh, Navajo Lake um, outside of Dolores um, in Southwest Colorado, where I um, had a really awesome time one a couple of years ago. So there you go. That sounds really great. And we're really happy to have you here in Utah. You can you know, infiltrate our situation over here anytime. Savannah, are you still on? Yeah, sorry, I am here. Uh, hi, everybody. I am the Compliance Archaeologist for the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. Um, I would have to say my favorite summer spot is the Wind River Mountains in Wyoming. I grew up backpacking there almost every year since the time I was six years old. However, I haven't been able to get back there the past few years because uh, life is busy, but I'm going back there in a few weeks for the first time in about seven years. So that is definitely my favorite summer spot. Very cool. Thanks. Um, Seth Button. Hi all, I'm Seth Button. I'm with the Division of Oil, Gas and Mining in the Abandoned Mine Reclamation Program and uh, um, about handling uh, compliance stuff for pretty well the whole division. And um, I don't get to uh, to visit many of my favorite spots in the summer. I'm, I'm just lucky if the spots they send me to have a little bit of green on the map at this time of year. I'm just looking for trees and water anywhere I can. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that on your Instagram. It looks pretty hot and dusty. <laughs> um, Shannon Boomgarden? Hello. I'm Shannon Boomgarden. I'm an archaeologist at the Natural History Museum of Utah, and I'm chair of the Range Creek Field Station, which is also my favorite place to be this summer and pretty much the only place I'm going between my house and there. So I would say that's my favorite. Awesome. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and just really quickly, I think we might have been able to unmute Paula. Paula, are you able to um, say hi to everyone? Uh, perhaps no luck. Okay. Um, we have a second Shannon, Shannon Cowell. Hi, um, I am a preservation archaeologist with Archaeology Southwest, and my favorite spot this summer 
since I live in Tucson and I'm trying to stay close to town is Saguaro National Park East. Oh, that sounds nice. I used to live in Tucson. Um, Stacy Ryan. Hi everyone, I'm Stacy Ryan. I also work at Archaeology Southwest. I'm a preservation archaeologist and Shannon and I work together on um, an anti-looting and anti-vandalism uh, movement, uh, specifically a focus on tribal lands, but you know, obviously this happens everywhere. And my favorite place I'm going to in about a week and a half is Era Viper Canyon Wilderness because there's always water there. So we'll be able to sit in the creek even if it is 100 degrees. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Steph? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stephanie Wacha. I am with Friends of, I'm the Education Director at Friends of Cedar Mesa. Um, I use she, her pronouns and my favorite spot this summer is my neighborhood and the open space just adjacent to it. Um, noticing kind of the little wild spaces that pop up here and there and also just getting a chance to have some vibrant human interaction in uh, this time where this is what we have. So happy to be here. Awesome, thank you. Valerie? Hey, Valerie, we will circle back in a minute. Wanda? Hey, everybody. My name is Wanda Rashkow, and I work with Friends of Cedar Mesa. I'm the statewide site stewardship coordinator, which sounds quite lofty, but I'm working with a BLM to help set up stewardship in the BLM offices in Utah. My favorite place this summer, because it's hot and you can't go anywhere, is Palm Desert City Park. Lots of big trees, shady. If you get up at 6 a.m., you can meet your friends there and take a walk. <laughs> awesome. We also have someone dialing in, uh, so I don't have your name, unfortunately. It's a 435 number ending in 8584. And sometimes it's difficult to take yourself off mute on the phone, I've, I've realized that with these Zoom meetings. So I think I was able to unmute you. Uh, the 435 number, do you wanna introduce yourself? This is Don, I think that's my phone. Hey, Don, Don Montoya. I, I was without audio, so I called in on my phone. That's a really great workaround. Well, great, thank you. Do you wanna introduce yourself? I, I did a poor job of it earlier would do you want to okay uh i'm a semi-retired archaeologist i uh, work for the blm out of the moab field office prior to that i was the curator at the anasazi state park museum in boulder utah where i'm at now working on a project accessioning records from a uh, collection that we have and i come to boulder to get away from the heat but uh, where I live in Castle Valley is quite nice as well. Awesome. And I see that we didn't get Steve and Diana Acerson, and I don't know why you guys were not in the alphabetical order, but can you guys please introduce yourselves? I'm Diana, my husband, Steve, get over here. And we are with the Utah Rock Art Research Association. We're really highly involved in the conservation and preservation part of that organization, which includes what we're talking about here with combating vandalism, specifically for us for the rock art. And our favorite place, or at least mine this summer, we did our annual family whitewater rafting trip down Desolation Great Canyon on the Great Green River. It was awesome. And it was comfortable temperatures and so much fun. So yeah, if you haven't been there, you gotta do it. So cool, thanks. Um, B. Travis Wright. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks. Uh, you can just call me Travis. Uh, <laughs> I'm crossing the border as well. I live in Colorado. Um, I'm an author and historian on Rollins Pass and the Moffat Tunnel. Uh, and that also happens to be my most favorite summer spot is Rollins Pass. Um, I volunteered with U.S. Forest Service Passport in Time uh, and Colorado State University's archaeology teams on Rollins Pass. Uh, I'm pretty active with uh, museums in Grand County, and I'm also on Gilpin County's Historic Preservation Board. 
Uh, you and I connected a while back on LinkedIn because uh, I was passionate about your project on combating archaeological vandalism. So uh, that's why I'm here today. So cool. Glad you found us. Yeah, thank you so much. So we've got a couple of other people um, that I'll introduce uh, who've, you know, been in the chat because, you know, technology. So Paula Flepson says that she is a non-agency archaeologist consultant working in the Southwest for 20 years. Her favorite place is anywhere as long as there are as few people as possible. So she's really interested in public and tribal inclusion in interpretation and protection of sites. And she is a strong proponent of site steward programs. So welcome, Paula. And the other person who, um, who has texted is Val Russell. She is archaeologist for the BLM in Grand Staircase Escalani National Monument. Her favorite place is Flathead Lake, Montana, which she visited every summer growing up. Last week, though, she discovered the high country of the Tusher Mountains and Mount Dutton. Down, um, if you guys know, it's down around Grand Staircase, Grand Staircase Escalani. She says there's lovely wildflowers, cool shade, streams, and meadows. So welcome, Val, and thank you, guys. Um, I think Marty, are you um, are you able to unmute yourself and say hi? No. <laughs> okay. There. Did that work? Yes, it did. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm from Moab, Utah, and I'm a volunteer for the BLM and the National Park Service. Um, I, my husband and I site steward um, 30 sites in, in Mill Creek Canyon, and then hopefully one for sure site uh, for the Park Service, maybe one more, although it's too hot actually to go down there right now. So we've been off to the La Platas, the Henrys, Boulder Mountain, and the La Salles for just weekend trips. And I want to say hello to Shannon and Liz and Laura. I haven't seen you guys forever. That's it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marty. So if we have missed anyone, um, I do apologize. Uh, give us a couple of seconds here if you want to unmute yourself and say hello. I think we might have done it. I think we got everyone. So and I think I figured out how to unmute myself. <laughs> this is Nicole Lohman. <laughs> Apparently you have to unmute yourself on your phone and the computer if you linked up with your phone. So um, anyways, I'm Nicole Lohman. I'm an archeologist with the BLM Utah State Office. And um, I work with our deputy preservation officer who's Nathan Thomas. And part of my duties include public education and outreach. Um, so um, I work closely with the SHPO and um, Tread Lightly, who's one of our partners for our education campaign. Um, and this summer, I guess um, one of my favorite places is we've been doing a lot of hiking in the Wasatch and I've been um, it's been really interesting um, poking around on the Park City side and checking out all of the old silver mines out there. It's been really cool to happen upon some of the mills that are still out there. So, Yeah, we do have a lot of Thanks. the mills that are standing, pretty cool. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, sorry, I'm just organizing the next thing, um, which is sort of diving back into the campaign to stop archaeological vandalism. A lot of folks here are um, our second timers from our first meeting back in January, but we have a, new, a few new faces as well. And so we're all coming at this from a huge variety of different backgrounds, which is really critical to making partnerships that work together, right? Ma really critical to make sure that we're hitting all of our bases and we're getting that diversity of thought um, as we work to fight vandalism here um, in the state of Utah. And for those of you visiting, hopefully we can export some of this um, to your states as well. So let me jump back in to this presentation. Um, and I'm sorry, the first time I did not have the chat window open, it's open now. So if you guys are unable to see the presentation, please let me know, or if there are other problems going on, and I'll try to respond as soon as I can to that. So to recap, the campaign to stop archeological vandalism was what I had originally been calling the campaign to combat archeological vandalism. I got some feedback that stop archeological vandalism was perhaps um, 
an easier, uh, easier message for people to connect with. So we're moving it over to the word stop and not combat. So the campaign to stop archaeological vandalism was something that we had all discussed back in January and through the brainstorming and breakout groups, we came up with three realms. They're actually different than the, the sort of three realms that I had originally thought of, which is fantastic. I'm so glad that you guys figured out a new way to structure this. So in general, we're looking at data. How do we collect um, and review the old data um, that currently exists in site steward forms, in professional archaeological site forms, and you know, in ARPA cases, things like that. How do we review the data to find trends in where uh, vandalism, destruction, looting are occurring? And from that, develop solutions to head it off at the past. And then also, how do we collect new data as there are new instances of damage occurring? How do we capture that, collect it, and, um, and ingest it into sort of a global system so that we can trace these trends? The second branch is in education and outreach. This was really huge too. Um, people have, I think, rightly identified that we need some sort of larger public awareness that sometimes people genuinely don't know that, for instance, they shouldn't touch rock imagery with their fingers. Um, some people erroneously believe that it is just fine to pick up you know, an arrowhead as long as maybe it's just one. So how do we reach those people um, at the times that they need to be reached to tell them the message, perhaps for the first time, perhaps repeating it, just give them the message about how to visit these sites respectfully. And so we're gonna hear from a couple of our partners here today that I know are working on that and I'm pretty sure other people are too. Um, the other thing that people identified is that we need K through 12 curriculum that that's probably the easiest way to reach an audience is when we're teaching students about history and archeology span and different people here in Utah and around the world, when we're teaching them for the first time, insert a message of stewardship, protection, care and respect in those curricula. Um, the last thing that's really critical, um, and even though I mentioned we're a diverse group, I think you'll notice that we don't have a lot of tribal engagement here. And so that's something that we're still working on. Um, so tribal engagement is honestly very huge. Um, we need to have not only the buy-in of people whose heritage often, that's what we're talking about, um, but they also have different audiences that they can connect with, different audiences that they wanna connect with and different messages that they wanna bring, bring out. So that's an area where we're gonna to continue to work hard in the second half of this year. The last sort of branch of our campaign to stop archeological vandalism involves proactive solutions. So things like site cleanup and stewardship, getting people out onto the ground, interacting with the sites in a positive way and not in a detrimental way. People talked about increasing the number of registers at sites that um, there might be some data behind the idea of having, you know, an ammo can with a register in there saying, hey, record your thoughts here. Please don't put your name on this, on this wall of rock imagery. Um, so we do want to install some more of those. And there was also a really creative solution about maybe some remediation training um, for how to do rock imagery cleanup. So there are some limited cases where it's appropriate to go out and remove damage and graffiti, things like that from rock imagery panels specifically. And it would be really wonderful if we could find a way um, to have professionals train people on how to do that. So that you know, if the National Park Service has a problem, they have a reservoir of trained volunteers that they can bring out to their park and have work with them. So those were a few of the things that really popped out, a few of the things that were repeated in almost every breakout group. Um, I should also add in here law enforcement. How do we articulate with law enforcement? How do we report to law enforcement? Um, but obviously we had you know, almost 80 people, I think. We had a lot more ideas than this, but for this half year meeting, these are the ones that we're gonna just quickly touch on a little bit. 
So what we've been doing here at the Utah Public Archaeology Network and the State Historic Preservation Office has really focused on public awareness. Um, we had an opportunity to create a small um, advertisement. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen for a quick second to show you guys. We had the opportunity to create an ad inside the Utah Travel Guide. Um, so this is, you know, when you go to restaurants or parks and you see that big rack of um, rack cards this size, that's what we're talking about. So within all of those now, you've got this travel guide and it has our advertisement. I'll share my screen again so that you can actually read it a little easier. Oops, there we go. And so it's short and sweet, right? Good idea, taking a pottery class. Bad idea, taking a piece of ancient pottery. And it says, every day we are losing, or sorry, just, it says, we're losing Utah's history. Every day, visitors to Utah's outdoor wonderland take home pieces of our past, such as arrowheads and pottery. Leaving artifacts in place and having respect for archeological sites ensures that these sites stay with us for thousands of years to come. Together, we can stop archeological vandalism. And it opens up to a web page. I hope that I'm correctly sharing this web page. So it'll take a minute for all the elements to load for me because I live in Midway, Utah. It's a little bit in the sticks. <laughs> so my internet's a little slow. So we've got our nice banner and then we have some information on what is an archeological site. Um, you know, please, please don't do this sort of thing. Tips for visiting archeological sites, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just very quickly our, um, our website. We do have the ability to add to it. And so I know that a lot of you guys have messages that are really closely aligned with this, that are the same message as this. So I'd like to work with you guys on how we can modify some of this website because it's a little bit of a front door. It's a doormat for people who are learning this for the first time. So I want this to be a good welcome mat for all of the partners here in the Utah Public Archaeology Network. We ended up having to move kind of quickly on this, um, you know, for government reasons, right? You hurry up and wait. Like we got, we got everything pulled together really at the last minute for this because we had an opportunity. Um, so that is very quickly what I wanted to show you there. The last bit of um, media that we have created for public awareness are these, um, these artifact information guides. This was actually inspired by Ryan Moreau. He was talking to me one day and he said, you know, we have a lot of people who know a little bit about archaeology, but they don't really know why it's important to leave things in place. Um, and so people will take things because they feel like they know best. They feel like they, no one has made the value judgment to them why to leave things in place. People have only said it's important to do so. And so this is trying to make a persuasive argument to that group of people who know where archeological sites are and who appreciate artifacts, but perhaps only appreciate them for their aesthetic value. And so we're trying to, through these eight and a half by 11, you know, just uh, guides, we're trying to show them what the value is for, um, for data collection, what the scientific value is. So this is, you know, just a couple of pot shirts is my example here. And, you know, how much does, how, how much joy is this going to bring you if you keep it in your dresser drawer versus how much information is this going to tell an archaeologist if you leave it in the proper location? So we have these coming up. Um, this is just a few, a few things. This is my quickie little introduction before we actually turn it over to a couple of our partners, because I know that our partners have been doing things as well. So up next, I would love it if some folks from Cedar Mesa could hop into this conversation. I know that we have Stephanie and Wanda on the call. So if you guys are willing and able, oh, looks like I got a chat, but it wasn't. Is that site live? What is the web address? Yes, sorry. The site is live. 
the web address, you can type in this whole long utahshippo.gov or um, I'll put it in the chat too. It's bit, it's bit.ly and then stop, stop archeological vandalism with some dashes in between. So I'll provide that in the chat in just a moment. Um, but yeah, while we're getting that done, um, Stephanie, can I ask you to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanna say thank you so much for inviting us to kind of share a little bit about what we're working on today. And I'm so excited for those artifact guides and the, the website. Um, so at Friends of Cedar Mesa, we have a campaign called Visit With Respect. Um, it's intended to teach well-meaning but uneducated visitors how to visit cultural resources in a way that isn't going to damage them. Um, and I wonder, Elizabeth, would it be possible for me to share my screen or no? Absolutely. Let me make sure that awesome. I turn that on. I'll just go ahead and make you co-host. And then you should have all the powers of screen sharing. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll do that. Okay. Can everybody see the visit with respect? Great. Um, so this is a homepage on, so we've taken a number of different ways, uh, approaches to sharing this information with the public. Um, but first I wanna share with you what that information actually is. So they're super simple, um, designed for, for visitor behavior modification, but not, not meant to be in a judgmental kind of way. They're meant to have a very friendly, informative tone. Um, so just basic stuff for all of us, leave all artifacts, don't touch rock imagery or make your own. And we have designed both we have, we, we intended these icons to be for sharing. Um, and so Elizabeth, if you want them on the, the Utah, the, I'm sorry, the UPAN website, um, we can certainly share or anybody else that's working on outreach efforts. Um, yeah, feel free, what we can share away, just uh, get in touch with me. Um, so this is one, and we have an ambassador program. Uh, we have volunteers that are trained so this is the website's bearsearsmonument.org if anybody wants to check it out. I'm gonna stop share. Okay, um, so we have Visit With Respect Ambassadors. They hike the trails. Um, we have some people that go out several times a week and some people that just come down about four times a year um, that are trained in these uh, the authority of the resource technique, which is engaging with visitors in a way that is, that is non-threatening and it's friendly and um, yeah, non-authoritative. And that the, the idea is that the authority is the resource. Um, and yeah, so I, I actually don't have stats on how many hours or uh, contacts we had in the last year, but it's been a pretty effective program and we do annual trainings. Um, if anybody is interested, we have another training coming up in September. It will be virtual with an optional socially distanced hike where we can practice. And we do uh, coordinate with the BLM on that. Um, and I should mention that this whole program was uh, developed in coordination with Respect and Protect uh, back in, I think, 2016, Wanda, maybe. Um, it was before my time at Friends of Cedar Mesa. So I think it's that old. Um, so we have our ambassador program. We have the Bears Ears Education Center in Bluff, Utah. Um, since there was no official visitor center for the Bears Ears National Monument, we opened it and it's with the primary mission of teaching visitors how to protect these resources. Um, the principles have been run by our tribal partners. Uh, we are working really hard on decolonizing our language and paying attention to uh, language or words that we might have been accustomed to using in the past for many, many years without necessarily a lot of consideration. And then um, seeing how our indigenous partners want these resources to be represented. Um, and we are trying very hard to um, decenter our kind of perspective and center indigenous perspectives. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, let's see, what else? So our tribal engagement, public awareness. We have that, we have a series of videos. Uh, we're coming out with a few new videos this fall. We also have the rat cards and publications. But one thing that we've started doing um, is we are coordinating with those local tourist publications. So for those of you in Southeast Utah, the Moab Sea and Dew Guide um, that you might see at restaurants and are very, very widely spread at hotels. I worked really closely with Susie Masterson who puts that out over the course of the last year, um, helping her work on her language 
um, you know, replacing rock art with rock imagery, stuff like that, as well as avoiding directing people to sensitive sites. And um, she peppered in visit with respect tips throughout. Um, so that was really, really useful. We also work with San Juan County 101, San Juan Record. Um, so yeah, so trying to diversify the approaches that we're taking. Uh, one thing that we're going to work on this fall, hopefully if we have the bandwidth, is a virtual stewardship program. Um, and so having volunteers go through the internet, find, find all those sites that are really popular in the Bears Ears region, um, and the, the blogs and the, the adventure blogs and the websites that are sending people there. And at the end, we're going to analyze to see what sites are getting the most traffic and reach out to them and see if we can put visit with respect advertisements on those websites. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of our strategy for the visit with respect program at this time. That's all I got. Cool. And especially that um, virtual stewardship, we had been talking about doing something similar um, up here at Shippo, but it's a big undertaking. So I'd love to help you in any way we can or, you know, amplify the message for you. Um, anything we can do. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we're we're in some of the initial like it's because it's such a huge data set right now. We're, we're in some of the initial stages of trying to figure out how to organize it and uh, figure out a good workflow for engaging volunteers. Um, but yeah, let's talk more about it. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah. Wanda, do you want to give an update on site stewardship? Sure. Can you give me um, screen sharing? I sure can. Everyone's a co-host. There you go. <laughs> All right. Wake up, slideshow. All righty. There we go. So we've been running a heritage stewardship program out of Friends of Cedar Mesa for about three years. And before we did start the program up, we actually did some research. Some of you may know Marcia Simonis. She um, distributed a survey to ask what stewards and administrators and archaeologists wanted to see in a stewardship program. And she, th that, that uh, survey was very informative in terms of what, what reasons bring people to stewardship and the differences maybe between what the agencies want from stewardship and what the stewards are looking for from stewardship. So I was able to take all that information and gather programs from other states and started to put together a program for the Bureau of Land Management in Utah. And it ties in very much with what Friends of Cedar Mesa is doing anyway. We want to protect the landscape in Southeast Utah and, and the stewardship program distributes that ideal to the rest of the state. And it's a group of partners, Friends of Cedar Mesa, the Bureau of Land Management, we've taken some ideas from the Visit with Respect program, and we put it together into the Utah Heritage Stewardship Program. Check us out on Facebook. That's where I post all the upcoming trainings. If you want to get involved, you can watch there. You can contact me directly at Friends of Cedar Mesa, or if you know people that want to be involved in stewardship, they can also contact their Bureau of Land Management office and let them know they're interested. These are our program goals, nothing too shocking. One of the things that we found in the program is this discourage and deter site vandalism. We've actually had some anecdotal instances where people were approaching their site and there were people on the site doing they didn't know what, and it drove those people off. And in terms of discouraging vandalism, we're finding out in the Cedar Mesa area that having concerned people out on the landscape does make a difference. There have been several instances of vandalism or looting that have happened during the, the shutdown, during the time when the BLM and San Juan County kind of discouraged anybody from recreating on those public lands. Well, that let all the bad guys run free. So we found that having our stewards out there, that's a good thing. It helps keep people in line and behaving themselves. And this is a little bit about what the volunteers will do. We teach them the visit with respect principles that Steph just went over, and we give them a really quick course in how to talk to the public. So they're not just out 
stewarding their sites, but they're engaging with and educating the public. One of the things we've also tried to do is, is make sure that the training is consistent throughout the state. You can train in one field office, but you can work in another, or you can work in several. We've got stewards that are working in both the Moab and Monticello field offices right now. And we've trained about 100 stewards in the, the past couple of years. And the big news is that we're fading ourselves out. We're taking ourselves out and we're giving Elizabeth the job. <laughs> so the goal is now that the state has approved a position at the Office of Historic Preservation for a statewide coordinator, a truly statewide coordinator that will coordinate all the agencies, not just the BLM as I do. We're going to transition from our statewide program to a program that's centralized out of the SHPO's office and stay tuned. It'll be building in the next couple of years. Elizabeth and I are trying to figure out what we can do until we can meet face-to-face -face with stewards, doing some online training, promoting the program. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome when it goes live and big. Thanks. Thank you, Wanda. And yeah, just in the in the gap between the uh, the January meeting and now, um, what Wanda was mentioning is that House Bill 163, sponsored by Representative Tim Hawks, um, passed the Utah State Legislature, which was really fantastic. Um, you know, we were popping champagne, and then a couple weeks later, COVID hit, and so what the <laughs> Well, you know, it was a little bit of a give and take. So we um, we did get the approval to create a full time equivalent, uh, an FTE that would be my colleague here at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. Because of COVID, uh, we had some economic woes, you know, nationally and certainly within this state too. And so, although we have that position on the books, we are unable to fund it this year. So we're still optimistic that next year that position will get funded or it'll be funded, you know, sometime shortly in the future. And so what we're going to do this year, me and Wanda and frankly, a lot of other people from my office, it's a big job. We are cobbling together this program and we're going to stand it up fully so that as soon as money hits and as soon as we're able to fill that position of statewide site stewardship coordinator, they will have everything they need. They'll have all their training materials. We'll already be talking with agencies about how to get um, data to them from stewards, how to get data from them from stewards. Um, so that is what Wanda was referring to. You know, that's that's our big, big goal for right now. Um, and it's going really well. We're really excited about it. And Friends of Cedar Mesa are really fantastic partners to work with. Um, you guys are doing a lot down there. So thank you. Let me share a window. Pardon me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so um, like I said, Friends of Cedar Mesa, they are absolutely incredible partners. They're crushing it down there in southeastern Utah and beyond. And another organization that we have here today that has a huge reach is Tread Lightly. So Tread Lightly has a program that they call Respect and Protect. We've got um, a couple folks on from Tread Lightly. I know we have Danielle on, and um, I thought perhaps Evan would be on today, but maybe he's on the phone. So if um, one of you good people from Tread Lightly could take it away, that would be great. Hi everyone, this is Danielle again with Tread Lightly. Uh, thanks for having us on today. Um, nice to meet some of you. Um, we attended the interagency um, meeting just a, a few weeks ago. Um, this is the first UPAM call that I've been on, so thank you for including us in this in this opportunity. Um, to those of you who were involved in the interagency meeting, there's going to be a lot of kind of repeat information here. So sorry about that, but um, just Good to be able to give some some information to some new new contacts here. So, as Elizabeth said, uh, respect and protect is a message that was developed by Tread Lightly in coordination with the BLM in Utah. And the goal of the of the message is to um, 
teach enthusiasts, recreation enthusiasts, to respect and protect archaeological, paleontological, and other cultural resources. Now, it started as a state message and has expanded, and it's being used in different parts of the West. Um, so to give you a little, I would share my screen, but unfortunately, I'm on my phone, and it's not going to go well if I try to bounce back and forth between um, my com uh, computer's you know, a website and my phone. So um, if any of you are interested, of course, I can speak with you afterwards, but I can send out some information um, through Elizabeth um, to guide you to our website and the Respect and Protect homepage so you can see some of the work that we're doing. Um, right now, what we're working on is completing a an agreement with the BLM here in Utah in order to support work of the Memorandum of Understanding that we've uh, signed several years ago. Um, the goal of that is to provide educational materials to recreationists, as we talked about, um, specifically motorized and more high impact type of recreation enthusiasts. That's our really niche in the in the industry is educating motorized users on how to act responsibly and sustainably when they're in the outdoors. Um, the message, of course, applies to non-motorized as well. So um, typically, you would be getting this update from Evan Robbins, who is our state coordinator. He manages our all of our Region 4 Forest Service agreements and also our agreements with the BLM in Arizona and Colorado, Parks and Wildlife. Um, but he was on his way back from a stewardship event this weekend, and so he's not able to attend today. So I'm happy to be with you in his stead. Um, but most of you will be working with Evan directly going forward if you have questions about the Respect and Protect campaign and how to implement it in some of your messaging. So you've seen the um, the logo there, or at least the original logo that was produced, and that's on Friends of Cedar Mesa's website, which was just the Respect and Protect bar. That has been updated, so we can send that out and make sure that you can uh, use the most recent logo there. And as I said, the work that we're going to be completing in the um, agreement with the BLM here in, or here in Utah is to support that MOU that we've signed. And that work will commence around October 1st. It will be for a year agreement. And it will consist of sending out education packs and materials to the BLM offices. Um, we'll be providing 11, 11 by 17 UV laminate signs and carcinate stickers to mark trails um, with educational messages speaking about how to interact responsibly with with cultural resources and sites. Um, also a, a specifically designed hang tag, which is about a, a three by five card that gives tips about how to recreate responsibly that people can take with them. So they always have something on hand. It's a great little handout to, for volunteers to have, especially site stewardship. If you're interacting with the public, we'd be happy to provide those to you as well. Um, and then recreation tips, which are third sheet tips that um, provide recommendations on, again, while you're doing certain types of activities, how you can behave in responsible, sustainable ways on the trails while you're recreating. And then we'll also be instituting a, a, a year long social media campaign, which we're really excited about. Um, our social media has been really, really important. Of course, this year, our campaigns have been very, very successful. Um, throughout the nation. We've been having really great response and engagement with those posts. And so really what we're looking at is, you know, working with you all um, to figure out exactly what your needs are from a recreation standpoint. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the reasons why people go out, of course, on public land is to recreate, get out, um, especially right now during the pandemic. Uh, people need a place to kind of escape to. And there's a lot of new people in the outdoors who haven't been educated before they didn't grow up um, with that background of stewardship or even, you know, what, what basic trail etiquette is. And so it's really, really important right now to be reaching out to brand new enthusiasts. And we can do that through a number of different ways. Social media is a great way to do that, but also um, dealerships that sell the, the equipment, you know, and, and retailers that sell the equipment where, um, these enthusiasts are going to buy their, you know, their backpacks and their hiking shoes and all of those kinds of things that they use to go out into the, into the outdoors. Um, so, you know, we'd really like to work closely with each of you to determine really what your needs are and how we can get these materials into your hands. Now, we do, we do have some, some funding 
available from the BLM, but we are looking for additional partners. So there, there's a lot of opportunity here, I think, to expand the message and you know reach out to different types of contacts. Um, so if there are uh, ways that you would like to contribute to the Respect and Protect campaign, or if it just means you know posting the logo on your on your website and helping promote that message, please let me know. Um, and we'll get that information to you so we can start collaborating. Um, I just wanted to point out, you know, again, with Tread Lightly, really what our mission is, is promoting responsible recreation. And so we see this issue through a recreation lens. You know, a lot of the people that we talk to are, they're not archaeologists. They're not people who are familiar with archaeology or cultural resource protection. And so um, a lot of really basic information needs to be shared with them and how they can interact with these sites and um, artifacts in a responsible way. So it's a, we're really looking to be kind of a mediator between some of the technical aspects of archaeology and resource protection. And then, you know, your layman uh, recreationist who is probably pretty new to this idea and, and these ethics and, and this theme. So um, looking for ways to develop new messaging. We do have print PSAs available. We have several videos available through our YouTube channel. And then of course the normal stickers and those kinds of those kinds of handouts. So if you're interested in having some of those available um, for your educators when you're speaking to the public, please reach out. Happy to provide those and get those in your hands. And that's all I have for today, unless there's a, there's questions. Yeah, thank you so much. I know when I talked to Evan about it earlier this week, he said that he was really excited to find other organizations to work with and to carry that message. Like you said, the message from the MOU. And Absolutely. Yeah, and I didn't know that this was an outdated logo. I'm so sorry. I'd love to have your updated logo. So oh, that's that's fine. Um, <laughs> it's just part of the collaboration back and forth. So yeah, we can get you the new, we've kind of revamped all of our, our message logos. So I'll get that over to you, Elizabeth, for sure. Fantastic. Yeah, so we'll we'll include that on the website, plus what Friends of Cedar Mesa was saying too about some of, some of their messaging. We'll be sure to get that in there because um, this is a collaborative and evolving effort. So thank you. This is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> me get back into that quick presentation. Um, so there's the old logo. Um, so thank you so much, Danielle, for, for hopping on. Um, I'm sure we'll all meet Evan at some point in the future. And I get that, you know, he, I think he was over in Colorado for his project that he mentioned. So yeah, he, he definitely needs a minute to rest and recuperate. <laughs> So I'd like to open it up to other organizations. So, you know, Shippo and Tread Lightly and Friends of Cedar Mesa, we're certainly not the only ones doing things. We're just the only ones that had slides. <laughs> so um, I would love it if you guys who are on the call could sort of just jump in and let us know what's going on in your organization, particularly things that would be helpful for our efforts to stop archeological vandalism. But honestly, anything, um, what are you guys up to? What would you like to see this organization do? And more, I think the most important thing, how can we help each other to accomplish the goals that your organization has? And I know on Zoom calls, it's a little awkward, so I'm gonna give it a long lead time. So this is Justina, if you want me to go. Yes, and please. Uh, from State Parks. Elizabeth, I sent you some photos in your email so that you could share screen if you wanted to, so I didn't have to, yeah. didn't have to do. So I'll talk while you're finding those. I, I'll say some stuff that's happened out at Danger and Jukebox Caves. For those of you who might not have heard, Danger Cave, uh, it has been made into uh, one of the first state monuments. There's two. And so, um, We'll be getting a little bit more interpretation out there, but as far as vandalism goes, it's an ongoing fight out there. And one of the amazing things that's happened, so I installed um, cameras, uh, spy cameras, whatever out there. And unbelievably during two different public tours, uh, 
one was stolen during one of those tours and one was stolen during another one of those tours. I mean, it just, I can't even, you can't even believe that that would happen, but it did happen. So then we got um, other cameras out there that had automatic feeds that uploaded to the internet with the feeds of pictures. And that's been going pretty great. Um, but just this week, someone threw rocks at the cameras in jukebox and knocked it down. So through the, they're gated, the, the caves are both gated with steel gates, but someone was able to throw rocks in and knock down the cameras. So anyway, that's ongoing out there. Last time when we met, we were talking about, and, and Elizabeth, you were super interested that we were doing tactile signage uh, at Fremont Indian State Park to prevent people, I mean, like to try to prevent people wanting to go up to the petroglyphs and touch them. So uh, I sent a couple of pictures of how these were working and they seem to be working pretty well. I know you had wanted to, um, I know you had wanted to have Kevin put a camera there or whatever, but honestly, we are having historic visitation uh, numbers at our state parks, along with the fact that uh, we're having a hard, hard time um, retaining people because of their like seasonals because they're afraid of COVID. So we have really our managers and assistant managers are taking like gate receipts and stuff and you know cleaning toilets and and just doing all that kind of stuff because uh, of this situation. But anyway there's this picture and another picture of people interacting with the signs and it seems to be working because they can touch something. <clears throat> uh, oh maybe it didn't say oh there it is. Yeah, yeah so sorry it just is cut off. Let me there we go. That's all right. So the and so you know they're using that as a base and looking at the rock imagery, <clears throat> and so those signs seem to be working. I just wanted to share that with with folks. Then um, there's a beautiful picture of the comet at yes. Fremont. Uh, well, there. So what's interesting about that is there's an ongoing archaeoastronomy study at Fremont Indian State Park, and Fremont Indian State Park is also applying for international dark sky status. They're a gold tier. So there is <clears throat> seemingly imagery and, and interaction with uh, celestial objects with these rock images. And so anyway, just a beautiful photo I thought I would show, share with you guys. Then the next set is um, a Kodachrome uh, Basin State Park is also, I think that's upside down. I know, oh. yeah, I think it's upside down for some reason. But anyway, um, I can fix the, it. There is Kodachrome Basin is also applying for international dark sky status. And while I was looking up some trying to do the human history at the parks, so going back as far as I could go, <clears throat> I ran across some pictures on Smug Mug or uh, one of those share or Pinterest or something of this. And uh, I called up the uh, both Jonathan Till and the manager of Kodachrome State Park. And Co uh, Jonathan is our archaeologist and curator at Edge of the Cedars. And I said, whoa, this looks significant to me. So the, the local lore is that this was carved by, quote, cowboys. So Jonathan is going to go and record it in September as soon as he, he can get away. And, but if anybody out there knows of this already and knows if anything, we have not been able to find any literature on it or any recording of it. So this is in Kodachrome Basin State Park. It's a little tiny ca uh, cave. And this is all around it. I mean, there are like hundreds um, and it, you know, of varying depths and stuff. So if anybody knows anything about this, please let us know. But Jonathan's going to go over and check it out in person in uh, September and record it if we don't find anything has already been recorded on it before that time. And that's just some of what's going on in Utah State Parks. So. Thank you, Justina. This is really weird. It's cool. Yeah. Elizabeth. Yeah. Diana. And I wanted to bring everyone up to date on what we're trying to work on. Of course, COVID has kind of put a hold on it, but we're trying to get going again. Um, we have put together a list of 60 communities, towns in the state of Utah with rock art in their vicinity. And our goal is to approach the city councils or mayors, whatever, of those towns and, and cities and give them some educational information on what rock art, rock images are and why they're important to protect and save. 
Uh, we've collected information for a packet to give to these city leaders from not only state history and tread lightly, um, but through URA. And um, we're looking for any additional information that anybody would like to share for these packets that we can deliver and present at a city council meeting. Um, our feeling is if the city leaders, if our leaders, period, understand why protecting these cultural resources is important, that they will then share with their um, constituents. And we've also put together a letter from URA and thank you, Elizabeth, for your letter from State History uh, to introduce why it's important and also have an insert that the city leaders can use to put in their water bills or newsletter or however they notify their citizens of what's going on. Um, it's an educational effort. It's a pilot program, I'm calling it. We don't know if it will make any difference, but we felt that there are some critical areas where there's a lot of damage to rock art, especially Fago Canyon, for example, near Green River. Um, so we're trying to hit these communities first. We've picked out 20 that we're gonna start with that are having some impacts to these images that we wanna go and talk to their cities and see what we can do to protect that rock art. Yeah, the gumption there is terrific. It's absolutely incredible. <laughs> guys are, are that's it's such a cool project, just going straight to community leaders. So. Well, it's an educational effort. And we think that's, you know, that's been the main area where everyone, I think in UPenn is concerned that we educate. Mm -hmm. And we may not be able to get into the school system curriculums as yet. We're trying our efforts through charter schools uh, to get in to why it's important to protect these cultural resources. But we figure this is something we can do immediate and hit adults in a public awareness type program, but in an area where there is impacts right now going on. Mm -hmm. so. Now we're also on the ground with managing agencies trying to get different events and things happening that's destroying rock art in close proximity, West Mountain, Lake Mountain. And we found some success there. Got one of the shooting lanes closed. So thanks, Shabot. Yeah. Um, thank you to B the BLM for for enacting that closure and, and Sitla too over in the Lake Mountain area. Yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, they've been wonderful partners. Probably, hmm, should have brought this up earlier, but um, we have a website to report uh, archaeological vandalism. Let me pull that up in a moment here. Sorry, I apologize, everyone. I should have had this queued up. Um, this is a project that the State Historic Preservation Office is trying to pull together um, so that we can um, sort of centralize and anonymize some reporting. Let me share my screen. So one of the things that we had heard from that first meeting back in January was uh, we needed a way to articulate with law enforcement a little bit better. Um, when there are instances, when there are problems, a lot of times people who are out hiking don't know who to contact. Um, I know that there is a BLM tip line and we do have that on our website as well. I assume there are also ways to contact the Forest Service for SITLA and we're gonna collect those resources on our website so there's a centralized place. That kind of requires you to know about the website. So we wanted something that is just you know, searchable on Google or whatever people are using. But if they type in report archeological damage, vandalism, destruction, that it would bring them to this form. And so uh, this is really just for the state of Utah. It's kind of buried in the text here, you know, in, 
in Utah. So, if, you know, if we do get things from New Mexico or Arizona, we'll try to link that to the proper authorities. But for here in Utah, um, this is an anonymous way that any member of the public can tell us what happened. Um, damage to give us the location to the best of your ability. We'll try to find it in our records and see if we have a site for it. Um, we'll also, the first thing we'll do is we'll find out who is that land managing agency, right? Whether it's BLM, whether it's private or CITLA, whoever. Um, and we will route this report unedited straight to um, that organization. And so um, the one of the big things that we're working on for the remainder of the summer is connecting with these land managing agencies and organizations to find out who we need to get this information to. So where you were, what's the nature or, of the damage or vandalism, any other important details, any photos, whether you contacted them. And then if you don't want to be anonymous, if, if you're fine getting follow-up questions and calls from either us or law enforcement, you can do that here. And so there is a bit.ly link for it. It's bit.ly slash report archeological vandalism. I will put that in our chat right now um, so that if you guys need it, you can have it. Um, it's also going to be on our website. Oh, and Danielle says that she's got to just got to go, but thank you, Danielle. And if you need to contact Danielle, her information um, and Evan's information are both in the chat. So sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent, but um, just, just dropping, like remembering something based on what Diana was saying there. And I just wanted to mention that we do have this at bit.ly slash report arc vandalism. And yeah, thank you, Acersense, for everything you guys are doing out there. You're doing fantastic work. Is there anyone else who has something they'd like to share from their organization or projects that they would like to undertake and maybe would like some help with? Elizabeth, hi, this is Stacy Ryan with Archaeology Southwest. Hey, Stacy. Um, I just wanted to let you know, you know I, know, I know I'm not working directly with any Utah organizations right now, um, but we are in the early stages of working with a, um, a communications agency to start our website as well. Um, they've secured the safehistory.org domain for us. Um, and I, I don't know, I think it's going to be probably a couple months before we have something live. Um, I know we're hoping to do some reporting on there too. We haven't really fleshed out the parameters on that, um, but yeah, I definitely want to keep, you know, correspondence open between us. Our missions are very parallel, so that's why I like to attend these. And um, you know, I'm happy to to share um, with you and and Chris Merritt and some more details if you're ever interested. Yeah, absolutely. And it also sounds like you guys should probably connect up with Friends of Cedar Mesa and Tread Lightly. They might have some graphics and some language that you can just plug and play. You know, I know they've got those visit with respect principles that are really fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I know that some other people in my organization have worked pretty closely with some people in their organization. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's really great that we've got so many people working on this. Yep. And Steph from Friends of Cedar Mesa says she's happy to share. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for being here, Stacy. Glad to have you. Thanks. And uh, this is Patrick from the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation. Um, so one thing that we've been kind of addressing, um, Chris can speak on this as well, is you know, with our infrastructure projects, um, I think Chris gave me the number that there's about 200,000 archaeological sites across the country, um, you know, not all necessarily tribal, but um, our projects often can run pretty close to some of these sites. Um, I think the most, you know, not troubling, but the one that kind of brought it all up was a, a park in Moab. And so we are trying to revise um, some of our grant language to include um, surveying or just kind of get some type of advice um, or guidance from archaeologists um, in this um, and 
you know, as projects are being planned and built, um, you know, and, and so that's just kind of one of our newest developments is just trying to find respect for that um, and find a process to to kind of work around um, how we can combine recreation with, you know, a respect and a protection of these sites. Um, you know, I would be really interested to see, you know, if these things increase, decrease vandalism, you know, with higher recreation nearby, um, you know, but so if anybody has any like research, anything that can kind of point to that, some of the best ways to, to combine them, you know, that they kind of celebrate the sites as well as, you know, give the venue for an actual recreation experience, you know, I'd be very interested in that, um, as well as, you know, any type of network for archaeologists that we can, you know, we can have at the ready to, you know, give to our grant partners as they're applying to make sure that they are going through the correct process to, to give respect um, and protection to these. So that's just kind of what we're up to right now. <laughs> Yeah, Chris Karambolis, if you're still on, where can he find some information about uh, good archaeologists who are permitted to work here in the state of Utah? So you can go, you can go to the Plipco website. And let me see if I can remember. I'll I'll send the link via this chat. Can I do that? But we have a um, uh, a real-time list of permitted principal investigators with all of their contact information. So let me copy and paste that and I'll shoot it right over to you. Great, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, I had one other thing I forgot to, to share with everybody. Please, Wanda. I, I hope I'm not stepping on, on Patrick. Oh, no, I'm, I'm all done. All right. Uh, we are still working to put together a regional stewardship conference in October. It was originally planned to run in combination with the Great Basin Conference, which has been canceled due to the COVID concerns. So we're going to go virtual. We're going to do our conference online. There'll be no cost. So watch again the, the Utah Heritage Stewardship Facebook page for more information on signing up as we figure out how to do that. Uh, it'll include some educational things geared more towards coordinators and, it, you know, program administrators, agency archaeologists, but it also is going to be targeted towards stewards. So there'll be educational opportunities for the stewards. And we're planning some fun things like maybe a happy hour at the end where we just have stewards come on and share their experiences with being a site steward. So keep an eye on the Facebook page and let me know, you know, drop me a note at wanda at cedarmesafriends.org if you're interested in, in getting more information about our regional stewardship. And by regional, um, it was supposed to be just like a Four Corners regional, but now it's like the entire western half of the U.S. and Florida. So, so it's a pretty wide region. So hope to see you guys participating this fall. Thanks, that's really cool. And I, um, yeah, I was wondering about that because I just heard that the GBAX got canceled, which is super sad. Yeah, it's kind of a shock, but Nevada is kind of a hot spot right now. In two ways, yeah. Are there any other organizations that have something going on um, that you'd like to share? And if not, that's okay too. We've had a lot of information here. <laughs> heard from a lot of partners about what's going on. And it sounds like just about everyone is um, looking for some, some sort of support or help or volunteers, um, which is really fantastic. And honestly, that was, that was what I had hoped when we first started. So we do not need to fill up the whole time. Um, I blocked out two hours just to make sure that we had enough time for everyone to have their voices heard. Um, if people feel like like this is a good natural sort of pause for this conversation, then I I would just like to say thank you again for coming. So excited! Oh yeah, 
Thank you. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about the blog? That was something new and I think it's really cool. So could you talk about the blog page you have? Um, which blog? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we've, let me pull that up. We have, we do have a blog. Um, and you go to history.gov history.utah.gov, I apologize, slash shippo slash U-P-A-N. It's a mouthful. You can come down here to our blog. And um, this is just where we sort of compile some thoughts we've had. So um, Diana is referring to, we have a new blog up from Urara. So um, the Utah Rock Art Research Association, Urara, um, wrote a very cool blog post for us. Anyone is able to do that, by the way. Um, and we're going to put this out in our UPAN newsletter that will be coming out next Monday. And we'll also this weekend share it on our social media channels. And so what the Utah Rock Art Research Association is talking about in this blog is a whole bunch of online video resources where people can learn more about um, rock imagery, here in Utah and um, across really the West and the US with their partner group, ARARA, the American Rock Art Research Association. So this is a real treasure trove of some cool, cool videos um, regarding um, mostly prehistoric issues. Is there anything you guys wanted to add, Diana? Did I cover this? Okay, I'm not able to actually see you guys because I'm sharing my screen. Um, but yeah, so the, the blog can be found again at history.utah.gov slash shippo slash upan and then scroll down to click on our blogs. Rebecca Simon from History Colorado, do you want to pop in? Ah, thanks, Justina. That's a great link. Um, but yeah, Becca, did you want to say anything? Sorry, I what was the question. <laughs> too many, too many windows. <laughs> For that. Uh, I, I mean, I was, I, I guess I, I threw in the chat that I was just saying, like, you know, I, I should have probably prefaced in my intro that the reason why I jumped on to this call is that, you know, if there's projects or things that obviously, you know, it makes more sense in the on the eastern side of Utah and the western side of Colorado to link up in terms of resources. But if there are, regardless of uh, location and geographic um, situations, um, you know, being as I work in the Colorado Shippo, the stuff in the Utah Shippo, and or wherever, I'm definitely trying to create those uh, connections more readily. So let me know, and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I mean, the one nice thing about this COVID pandemic is it's a lot easier for us to work with people regardless of their geographic distribution. So we're really happy to have you guys on. And it sounds like we'll probably see you at the stewards meeting in a few months. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Elizabeth, I might just jump in and, and highlight something that you've been working on, but I think it's good for everybody to understand that, you know, we have a lot of allies um, and a lot of big brains that we typically have not really even attempted to bring into the fold. And so over the last six months, uh, Elizabeth and I have been meeting with the University of Utah's Parks, Recreation, and Tourism program and approached them. Well, they approached Elizabeth, a student did, about doing a partner project. But, you know, these programs in major universities, Utah State has one that's similar. They have graduate students that are going into recreation and tourism type jobs, forest service, BLM planners, you know, stuff that overlaps with us, but we don't necessarily have formal education as archaeologists in 
uh, interpretive interventions, uh, meaning like how do we stop people from doing bad behavior? You know, I'm a dirt archaeologist. And when I see something being happened, I just want to hit them with a shovel. You know, that's my solution to graffiti and looters. Uh, Landmines, also another way. Uh, but these folks have like formal training, handling visi visitation, and trying to find unique partnerships and opportunities to get those folks to help us with our problems where we just don't have that educational or experiential background. And so that's been a positive um a positive partnership opportunity. We're working with the Price Field Office of the BLM to try some different types of signage to see what's maybe more effective. But I think the more we can make these cross-discipline partnerships, the better it is for all of us. Um, and so look in your own world and who you can overlap with. And also just a shout out to Friends of Cedar Mesa, maybe making the news yet again to uh, make a huge million dollar uh, movement to do more work in the Bears Ears area. So shout out to you guys for continuing to fight the good fight. Thanks, Chris. And I apologize. It feels like I jumped the gun a little a little early on, <laughs> on the thanks. Um, so if anyone else from other organizations has anything to contribute, would absolutely love it. Elizabeth, I have one follow-up comment. Um, seems like we've got a lot of people involved in a lot of different places, but I don't feel like I'm connected to any of those. Is there some way that we can set up a connectability line to where if we do something, we post it someplace, everybody else sees it, or if we have an immediate question or need immediate help, can we just go someplace instead of trying to remember where the state park person was or where the forest service person was or through the UPAN format or whatever, can we have some type of a place where we can all immediately put something in and have a response from one of the partners or share the good things that are happening or ask for help with the bad things. Yeah, that's a good idea. Like a list serve or something, right? Like where an email can go out to people who've opted in and anyone is able to write an email that just goes to a centralized source and then gets dispersed, right? Is that kind of Yeah, what? yeah. Yeah, it's just something I I it's kind of fun hearing what people are doing, but We've been four months or whatever into this and yeah. it'd be kind of fun to hear it when it happens so we can encourage or help. Yes. Looks like I can manually do that using the email account I have through the state, but let me look into how I can make a an, an email distribution list that I don't have to be the one to like copy paste over a message for you um, so that I don't become a bottleneck. Let me find out how to do that. Um, oh, Kate says that she can work on that. Kate Stratford, um, are, are we talking about the same thing? Because we just recently discussed seen some recent damage to a rock art panel. And if we could get a conservator or somebody to come up there and get that image off of there, it would probably keep others from, oh, somebody's already done it, so let's do some more of it. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was a vandal, you know, vandalized with a word. And it would be nice to get that word off there before it encourages more of the same. Yeah. And I, just, I know there's people in this group that do that or know of somebody. So it'd be nice to just put that out there and then have people respond. I can do that. And I can, um, I will figure out how to create a list serve and I will invite people who are on this call today, as well as people who were in the meeting um, in January and just some other folks. Um, yeah, and Justina and Chris have both clarified for me that <laughs> I saw Kate's note, I'll need to work on that. And I was like, oh, she'll work on it. She meant her people skills. <laughs> when Chris Merritt mentioned, that uh, you know, maybe he would like to hit people over the head with a shovel. Um, yeah, 
we all sort of feel that way. So hey, thanks. No, that's a great idea, Steve. And so that's something that is easy. I can do it. We'll get us all connected. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Just looking at the chat again. And that could also be a place where everybody can post their events that are coming up. And so if we want to participate with that event, you know, everybody could just post their events and keep everybody kind of in the flow of what's going on in this group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, to your specific point about, um, you know, particular words being written on particular stones somewhere, um, Don says that if it's around Moab, he does have trained graffiti mitigation people in Moab that might be able to help with that treatment. But yeah, we could we could get some sort of a list serve where you could get those responses faster, not every six months. Are there other organizations that have other upcoming projects or um, honestly anything, any, any way that we can help as a group? And this one, I will make the final call. And then this is the final call for, uh, for speaking up for your organization and then I think, I think we can break, Let's see. It's close to Green River, says Steve on the chat. All right, well, again, I thank you guys so much. This is so incredible. I mean, this is honestly everything and more that I hope that this organization could be. Um, everyone here is so passionate about education and archeological protection and learning more about peoples of the past too. Um, you're all an incredible inspiration and thank you for all you do. Thank you for being here. And with that, um, I will I'll tell you all have a great afternoon. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Kev.